thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Carl Rubin. Uh, I'm currently involved in Israeli programming for the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs. Uh, for those of you who don't know, FJMC. We are an international organization of 20,000 members worldwide. Membership is available to everybody as part of your synagogue. If you're not affiliated with a synagogue or your synagogue doesn't currently have a men's club, you're more than welcome to join us as an individual. If you need more information on that, you can reach out to me, or you can also just go to the fjmc.org website. Since the tragic events of October 7th, we have initiated a powerful program called Israel on My Mind. Israel on My Mind consists of two components. The first is a personal reflection where individuals are invited to submit a short piece on their personal connection with Israel. It can be a past experience with Israel. It can be something currently on your mind regarding Israel, or it can be something that you're looking forward to or a thought or an aspiration you have for the future. The key is that it should be a personal connection that you have with Israel. We then share many of these reflections with <laughs> others on our website, which again is fjmc.org. The second component of Israel on my mind is why we're here tonight. Every month we will be bringing you a speaker with some deep connection to Israel, and we will share with you their experience. These speakers can run from personal experiences, such as our guest tonight, Stan Greenspan, who I will speak about a little bit more shortly, uh, to those living or working or making Aliyah in Israel, uh, authors, writers, uh, some component to Israel, Again, whether it's cooking or art or technology or culture, uh, we're wide open on that. If you have any ideas for future presentations, please reach out to me. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our, our guest tonight for the first program of, of it such. His name is Stan Greenspan. Stan was born in Trail, British Columbia and raised in Toronto, where he lives with his wife of over 46 years, Vanessa. He's the father of Nicole, who's currently living in Tel Aviv, and Jesse, who lives in Toronto. A graphic artist and internet developer, Stan graduated in the first baccalaureate class in image arts program from Ryerson Polytechnical University in Toronto. Stan has been involved in the Zionist movement since almost birth, along with synagogue organizations and the FJMC for over 35 years. Stan was also the FJMC International President from 2017 through 2019. He's currently the President of Merkaz Canada. Stan was honored to be a member of the Masorti Movement Leadership Mission to provide witness of the October 7th atrocities. The mission to Israel took place on November 5th and went through November 9th. Stan serves as a member of the Executive Committee, Zionist General Council, where he has been the Missouri Movement's member of the WZO Budget Committee, which controls a near billion dollars of annual spending. Stan helps ensure that the FJMC, the WL, CJ, and Cantor's Assembly, and others in our world uh, receive new and significant programming grants from 2020 through 2025. Stan has represented Merkaz and Missouri at five World Zionist Congress and led our Canadian delegation at the Virtual Congress in 2020, the 125th Anniversary Zionist Congress in Basel, Switzerland, and the most recent Congress, the 75th Anniversary World Zionist Congress in Jerusalem in 2023. It is my pleasure to introduce my friend, as well as a friend to Israel, Dan Greenspan. Thanks a lot, Carl. Um, I appreciate the introduction and thank to, thanks to everyone for coming this evening. Um, let me give you a little background. Um, somewhere around October 20th or 25th, I was uh, at a, at a meet, men's club meeting at Beth Sedek in Toronto. And the rabbi came through walking down the hall. It was a bit early. I was just sitting on my computer doing something. And he said to me, um, are you going on the mission? And I said, they don't invite guys like me. They just invite rabbis. And he said, and he looked at me and he said, he didn't say anything. And then the next morning I got an invitation. So I'm going to blame Rabbi Warnick for making sure that I got there. It's not blame. Uh, uh, we're very good friends. Um, you'll probably know Rabbi Warnick. He was the head of the USCJ for about 10 years. And he's now in Toronto. He's been with us in Toronto for about four years. Very good, 
done a lot of great stuff. Um, I want before we start, I, I don't know if I can pull you easily, but I'm assuming that many of you have been to Israel and, and probably um, a, a pretty high number. Um, Canadians tend to visit Israel 5.5 times over the course of their lives. Americans are a bit less, about 0.5 times. But I'm hoping you guys can help us make that average go up a bit. Um, when I was when I received the the invitation to come, we hurriedly found a ticket. El Al is the only airline flying um, up until this day. Um, the only airline flying into Israel, so it, you have to get on an El Al flight. El Al flies out of a, a number of cities. They no longer fly from Toronto. It meant getting to New York and then and traveling on. And many of the rabbis on the on, on the mission were um, rabbis that you we all would know from from New York, from Chicago, from um, uh, Columbus, um, all over the United States, um, Pittsburgh, many of the significant rabbis. Rabbi Jace Kornsgold, who's the incoming president of the Rabbinic Assembly, was with us, along with many of the people from um, USCJ and the RA. Um, and and it was it was an interesting. You know, we got off. We we were met at the airport by um, Yitzhar Hess, who you met at the convention, and um, whisked through customs. Um, my bags didn't show up on time, which was pretty much normal. I mentioned this to the people beforehand. Everybody was asking to take stuff with. And um, I know that many communities were involved in in collections. You know, um, I know my wife went out and bought, you know, every roll of duct tape she could find because that was what they said they wanted. And we're pretty sure that none of those things have ever reached Israel yet because the, there's just so much shipping going in and they really don't have a problem getting those kinds of things. But we took stuff anyways. I had um, a whole uh, suitcase full of underwear and and uh, socks, et cetera, that we took with. Um, and we got there, um, we got on the bus and we ended up going to um, visit the, um, the hostage families at the square in um, Tel Aviv. We saw the table that had the 243 place settings for it. We met with hostage families. The the woman, um, we met with hostage families and mothers of the hostages. It was, it was you know, a, a kickstart. We went to the, to the place where they were distributing the goods that were coming in. And these are not not the stuff that was coming from North America or around the world necessarily, but things that Israelis themselves had given. Because part of what happened was that everyone who was in the Gaza and in the north were, where there was rocket fire were taken into the center of the country. So every hotel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem was full of people who had been moved from Sterot, from from um, Malot, you know, in the north, Sirot in the south, you know, all the kibbutzim, everybody was 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 moved and they didn't have anything with them. They didn't take things with. So they had a distribution center and they were very careful to make sure that everything was of the highest quality and whatever was donated, they were checking. It was a very interesting and, and, and marvelous thing that all these people were working, hundreds of people were working voluntarily to, to bring those things up. Um, we, landed, we ended that day um, in Jerusalem talking for in, at our hotel in Jerusalem. And the next morning we got up early and got on the bus to, um, to go down south. I'm going to start the PowerPoint now. Um, here, okay. So you should see it behind me, or maybe not. Okay. Um, just get rid of this piece here. I've got two screens, so I've got to do some things. So... The um, these are the you've you've seen the headlines. The um, they were out and um, and around um, all of the things that were going on. These are all from from different places. Um, we ended up going to uh, Kfar Aza, and as we're going down, you can see they issued us with helmets uh, and and uh, flak jackets, which we had to put on properly. Um, we had no idea. We also filled out a three page um, document, which was basically a, a, um, a waiver. And, and I turned to Rabbi Cornsgold and I said, uh, Jay, are you going to sign it? And he said, what choice do we have? So we all signed them. We all uh, gave them back in. We got our helmets on and made sure our vests were not uh, too terrible, made sure everything was fitting. 
And as we drove down, you can see in the, in the photograph in the middle, um, the Jeeps and the army were set up um, with checkpoints all over the place. And as you can see on the map at the top, um, Nitivot is where we were when I took the photograph. And you can see Barry and Saad. And Saad, um, just above Nakal Oz, is uh, Saad is where uh, Kibbutz Kfar Aza is. And as we pulled in, um, the first shot in the top uh, left is uh, personnel carriers. Um, and we were not used to the idea of going into a war zone. I don't know how many people on this call have ever been in a war zone, but it's a different kind of thing when you walk into this. It's a you, it, it just it, it changes it changes you at that moment. And as we're walking in on the top right, you can see it's very clearly met, labeled as a clinic. And the window on the far right, um, that hole is from an RPG, remote propelled grenade, um, that was fired at it. Um, the bottom uh, left, we're, that's us walking in as a group. And then uh, we began to, to, to listen to people tell us what was going on. I won't spend a lot of time on this because it was it was something you've seen in the news. It was, but you know, the fact that we were there and the fact that we saw the destruction. Um, the building on the right was one of the children's buildings, and they used when they when they did what they did. They used a very very high temperature grenade that in, in, engulfed the room in flames. And the smoke was so heavy, as you can see, it stained the building next to it. Um, those are doors that were ripped off, um, bullet holes in, in the drywall. And I, and I kind of laughed at myself because every time you watch a cop show and they're firing at everybody inside a house, you know, the bullets stop at the drywall. Bullets don't stop at the drywall. Um, this is down the main street. And as you can see, the destruction was, was just amazing. Um, and this was all... They didn't they didn't clean things up and and this is how it was left afterwards. And and you got to think about the fact that the night before was Simchat Torah, because in Israel, Simchat Torah, Shemini Yetzirah is one day. They had a party because regardless of whether they're religious kibbutz or not, they follow the holidays in some way. They would have had a party and, and they would have cleaned up afterwards because kibbutz nicks are very, very much proud of their homes and their and their and their villages etc and you can see the damage as we're we're looking at places i believe that's yitzar in the top um yitzar hess who was at the convention with us in the top right photograph um and you can see the destruction as you go through it and i'm not sure what the codes mean that they painted on the walls but i'm sure it's not um happy things um, as we got into the place, we were told to go in and take a look inside the houses. And the one thing that you saw is that every time you went in, the refrigerators were open um, and um, the pantries were also open in a lot of cases. You can see that. And there was destruction. This house, they didn't take the TV, but most they did. Um, you can see the damage that was done. Um, my sense of smell is not very good. I had an operation when I was much younger. Um and uh, a rhinoplasty, and I really don't smell things as well. And I didn't have this, the, didn't get an idea of it. I know we had a, a visit from a young woman, um, Eliza Kenner, through Dave and Danny's um, Sports Affinity, who talked about the smell of death. I didn't smell it, and I'm glad I didn't. It, it, it was, it, there was enough here for me as it was. And you can see all of the damage. The house on the top right, with the stairs is where the twins were taken um, as hostages. They're nine-year-old twins. On the bottom left, you can see the cars. They came in through the fence behind the gentleman who's taking a picture on the top left. Um, Gaz is in the background there. We were told not to go out too far because they were still shooting. Um, they weren't sure that the vests and the helmets would help. But um, but they came in first and they destroyed the cars so people couldn't escape. Um, and, 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 uh, you can see the, uh, the damage there. And then someone mentioning, yeah, Rabbi Cornsgold mentioned it too. So as we went in, we were looking at these things that were going on. And if you looked around, I didn't take a photograph of it, but I saw them all over the place. And that was the thing that first twigged me to it. 
Um, that's a can that was opened after the destruction, okay? And, and that's a bottle that was sitting over, you can see just beside to the right, you can see the bottle of the black. There's a bottle of soda of some sort. Um, here they came into somebody's house after the terrorists came through. The people of Gaza came through to visit Israel and to uh, participate in the looting. And that's, there's no question they were involved in it. Um, they came in and they took what they could. Um, you can see the food on the floor again um, and highlighted it. Here you can see uh, the soda and the tea and there's a cup still sitting there. And after the destruction, there's no way that's from the night before. This is the party they were having as they were killing. And the stories we heard were absolutely horrendous of what went on. Um, there's the destruction. Um, I won't tell you what the stains are. You can figure that out for yourself. Um, the soldiers did may, I'm not sure if the flag was there or not beforehand, but you can see what happened. They took us then to Nitivot, which is uh, a, a town a little bit further up. This is where they brought all the cars that were at the, the music festival. So you can see there's about 300 cars and they're all damaged in some way. The Jeep um, has a number of bullet holes in the hood. Um, the car on the right to it, um, the windows are blown out. And, and, and just, um, I don't know what the X means. I'm not even going to guess. Um, but you can see all the cars just piled up, hundreds of cars. And and the one thing that Yitzar mentioned to us was, you know, don't take photographs inside the cars because there's personal effects. There's there may be their insurance or their letters from their family or whatever. And and those are things that are private and should remain private. And we tried as best we could not to take a look at those things. But they were there, people were killed in these vehicles. Um at Nativo. Um, we went to the, it's the 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 parking lot we were at was right beside the um, the car park it was right beside the uh, this um, memorial for the IDF and we held a, we held Minka there and um, you can see we're all wearing um, uh, bulletproof vests and we did it we did the service as we were standing there and the thing that struck me was on the wall um, above the, the memorial. It says Liskor Olam, which is remember the world. It's not remember the IDF or remember the soldiers or remember the Jews, or remember Israel. It was talking about the whole world. And it was kind of a juxtaposition that got me. As we were davening, there was an artillery battalion very close. And every once in a while, they would pop off around, which would shake the, the ground and would shake everybody. Um, for those who know the service, uh, there's a part where you say Salah Lanu and you you hit yourself in the chest. Um, it's very interesting to do that when you've got a bulletproof vest on. Um, we ended up going, I don't have photographs and I wouldn't put them in if we did. After we left uh, Nativot, we went to Ramla, where the IDF has Shura base, which is what they call their processing facility which is where um, all of the bodies are brought, no matter if you're a Jew or Muslim or Druze or Christian. And everyone is treated with respect. Even the terrorists are, um, we're processed through there and properly um, properly de dealt with in terms of the halacha and the laws of the other religions. And that's where our friend Gadi Pearl, who was at convention was, and um, for those of you who had an interaction with Gotti, you know he was a very he's he is a very happy guy. Alan and Tom know him from from the Congress that took place um, in uh, was it August? Anyways, he's a really happy guy. Gotti made a presentation and he was crying halfway through it um, because of what he'd seen. His job was he's a major in the intelligent reserve major in intelligence. His job was finding things and putting them together with other things that were owned by the same person or were part of that person. Because when you heard the first numbers of 1,400 dead in, from Israel, they didn't know how to count things because many of the bodies had been dismembered 
and they they had to they had to match things up that was part of Gaddy's job um so it it was not a fun thing for Gaddy to participate in um my bags didn't get there on time and i found them because i had an air tag in them it showed up that they were at ben gurion and Gaddy was going back to jerusalem as it was i Gaddy gave me a lift he was telling me some more stories and as i got back to the um as we got to the airport, I went through the process of getting into the airport to get my bag. And I found uh, the, the the clerk, the woman from El Al, who was helping me. We're talking, you know, as you chat with someone as you're walking around looking for the bag. And then she started talking to me and she said, you know, where are you from? And I told her, and she said, oh, I have a sister in a place called Thorn Hill, which is very close. And I said, oh, and I broke down. I just started to cry on her shoulder. She was only like five foot two and I'm crying on, and I just couldn't stop it. And somebody was talking before we started about the fact that it was very hard to speak about this. And it still is very hard to speak about this when we were at some place where people were were um, massacred and, and with no regard. And it, it's difficult. We were sent as witnesses and we were sent to see what had happened because right away we knew that people were going to say it didn't happen. It was a, an IDF false flag mission or whatever. That's how things are these days. It was real. We we saw what had happened. There was no way that the barbarity that took place could have taken place without um, a demented uh, people. And when I said they're not, I said to someone, they're not humans. They said, no, they are. We have to understand that humans um, can be that depraved and do these things. Um, the next day we got to, uh, we went to the Hadassah Hospital in Mount Scopus. Um, for those of you who know history, Mount Scopus was was captured by the Jordanians in the 48 war. Um, but the hospital remained part of Israel for the entire time. It wasn't able to be used, but it was still there. And it has, um, since 67, it's been rebuilt and used. And it's one of the largest hospitals in Jerusalem. And it caters to um, everyone. Um, Israeli hospitals and Israeli medicals and Israel, Israel itself really doesn't discriminate against any of the citizens. So you can go there as a, a Jew or an Arab or, or a Muslim, a uh, Christian, doesn't make any difference. They treat you the same in, in the government. And it's not that they're treating everyone badly. They're treating everyone well, and everyone gets the same kind of care. I know from personal experience in the emergency room at that hospital that they take the person who is the most um, in need of help. They took us, first they took us on the bottom um, the bottom right there they took us into the into the hall we were we met a few of the people we met some people in term who had been rescued from um who had been part of the part of them part of what, what had gone on on the seventh we were also taken into the garage the parking garage which they cleaned up somebody as we were walking through mentioned he said you know we make Hold on hospitals a i want to put something on board um, can you can you mute, please? Um, we make we make we take we dig tunnels and we put hospitals in them. Um, other people build hot tunnels under hospitals to put arms in them. So you can see us walking down uh, into the hospital. Um, let me go on to the next one here. Um, this is the woman. Um, she's a nurse. She and her husband, who's a rabbi, um, he is involved with the IDF. They were taken to one of the bases. And um, for Shabbat, they went for Simchat Torah. They went to help the soldiers celebrate. And in the course of the day, in the course of the attack, she was there. Everybody was surprised. She was injured. She had um, bullet, bullets in her hip, her shoulder, and her hand. Um, she had two major operations before this. And she spoke about, and I can show the video another time, but a very heartfelt story about what happened, how she rescued people, how she saw terrorists coming at them. They were lucky. She escaped and she is involved in rehabilitation. And that's one of the things right now that Israel is most in need of. And it's difficult. Um, I was talking to Gary Cates, who's our uh, one of our members of, of our executive committee who's a psychologist, and one of the challenges for Israel is going to be providing psychological care for those um, who were, who experienced the trauma of war. And this is a, an extreme situation, and it's something that, that's going to require a lot of help, and it's difficult because, you know, it'd be wonderful to get 
you guys who can do this kind of stuff to, to help people, but you can't do it remotely. You have to be in the room. I'm sure, I'm sure none of the people in that profession would want to deal with extreme trauma um, without being able to see the person you know, live and seeing all the signs and things. So it's a difficult thing. Hadassah and other hospitals are working towards creating rehabilitation because of injuries and because of psychological um, damage that people had happened to them. Um, she, I'll, I'll go on. This is the hospital underground. They, uh, as you can see on the wall and mostly in the top right photograph, there are control panels for the oxygen and and the the tele the telemetry for um, that a modern hospital has. They didn't have any of those things on October seventh or eighth, but they ordered it right away, um, and they ordered and and they got everything in place and put things into place so they have 200 beds in the in the, the garage and they're able to take that and remove it if necessary or fill it if needed so you can see they put together this and it's it it's as clean as can be it's it's not a private room for someone who's in there but they're they're helped so the last part of it what we did was we went and met with president herzog um at, at their house in uh, in jerusalem and that's the entire group um, who were there. You can see, I'm sure you'll see people who you know. Um, the rabbi from uh, uh, Marietta, Georgia, I see him. Rabbi Dorf. Um, uh, there's uh, lots of people. Some of them you may know. Um, Rakefet is uh, standing in front of Yitzhar. Uh, both of them were at convention. And um, there's a number of people. Debbie uh, Kaner Goldrich, who is the president of... Um, of uh, Women's League um, after Margie Miller. So she was after myself. She she was concurrent with Alan Cahan, was on our trip too. So there's a that's that's what we saw. Um, so the next question is, what can we do? And, and I'm going to put these things out. And part of this comes from the speech that, that the president gave us. And he spoke about some things, which I'll get into in a second. But I think it's important that we recognize our enemies. We really have to understand who who we're dealing with and understand that that there are times when people are enemies and they're not always our friends. Uh, we have to recognize our own power. We are not that Jews have any more power than anybody else, but as people, we have the ability to do a lot of things. We all have the ability to get involved in, in politics by writing letters, um, by doing things, by participating in, in the rallies we've had. Um, doing the proper things that 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 we can do. I was talking to the chief of police here in Toronto, and he was telling me that, you know, they, they feel so comfortable with the Jewish community because we'll tell them when we're having a rally, as opposed to our opponents who are holding a protest wherever they, they do it, and it's not always something they're planning on doing. If you write the police, you write the politicians, you tell them something, they may not read every letter. But I got to tell you, they weigh them. OK, they actually look at the numbers and they see the numbers and they and that puts that slides the scale. And that's something that's important. We have to protect Jews everywhere. We have to do what we can to make sure that every Jewish person is is protected. We have to demand our rights. There's no reason for us to be second class citizens in any of our countries because we happen to be Jews and because there may be more people of another faith who have an opposing view. We have to demand our rights and make sure that our politicians follow through. Um, we also may have to adjust our philanthropic priorities. Um, we've seen what happens at the universities. We saw what happened at Harvard and others when, when the, the situation was not exactly the way we would have wanted it. And people pulled their money and that made for changes. And that's a good thing. If you're going to give someone a lot of money, you should have some say if they're doing something that's the antithesis of what you want them to do. And we have to begin to fight the long-term value, the long-term battles now. We can't ignore situations and let them get worse. That may have been what happened in October 7th. We don't know what, we don't know, we'll not know until after um, whatever reports and whatever investigations happen, and they will. Absolutely, there's no way that it's gonna be removed. It's gonna happen. But we have to be aware that, you know, it was just a little bit of rocket fire and just a little bit of this. And it's not so bad if there was only one bus, bus blown up. Those are things we can't accept. We have to make sure we start the we start to deal with that now. And I and while I don't agree with 
Prime Minister Netanyahu on many things, I do agree that this is something that has to be completed. And I think we also have to remember that we shouldn't be a shtetl Jew. We have to be strong, tell people we're Jewish. The more people hide they're Jewish, the less numerous we seem, and the more our oppressors and our and our enemies will decide that they could do something to the ones and twos that they see. Put a flag on your car. Wear them as put it, make sure don't take them as a zot down. That's the worst shunda you could possibly do. Make sure that people know you're Jewish without question. I mean, really, look at the names on here. We can't hide. Once they know our names, they know we're Jewish. It's not a problem. I have no problem with it. I'm sure you guys don't. But think of it that way. That's the first part. The second part is one of the things that the president said was that this is not a simple conflict. He considered this to be the beginning of the Third War, the Third World War. Let me just get out of this one. This is the last one. One of the things that, that came to us as we're doing it is, you know, that people want to rely on the Red Cross and other international organizations. This is a letter from the Red Cross to an American um, diplomat uh, from November 22nd, 1944, where he says, the, 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 the Red Cross person says, that we have no evidence that there are any crematoria or, um, or mass exterminations at Auschwitz. Okay? This is the Red Cross. Um, I would strongly consider if you make them, if you had them on your donation list, you think about not doing it. There is no reason for the Red Cross to have taken 107 days to even investigate where the hostages are and demand to meet them. Not acceptable. So um, let me go on to the next piece. Just give me a second. I've got to share the next one. I'll be back in a sec with that. That's me again. Um, okay, here we go. This is something that was put up by the coalition, coalition against democracy by American uh, Enterprise Institute, um, which is yes, it's a little bit of a right wing group, but they are well known in terms of what they talk about. One of the things that that uh, President Herzog said was that we're in the midst of a war between um, Russia, the People's Republic of China, and Iran. He also included. Uh, Democratic Republic of Korea, which is North Korea, um, and and they're working together in, in a lot of ways. And this is something that, that's come up. It's not, you know, he as he termed it, it's not a coincidence that Ukraine happened, that the Chinese are going into Taiwan, and that Iran has got all of its proxies going after Israel. Um, you know, there's a a story we may have heard that that says that the United States can can fight on one and a half fronts at a time. They're putting together three, um, and that's what their plan is. Um, I have this paper. If you'd like to see it, they've got all it, it outlines what's going on and where things are going and how things are are happening. You know, it, it's amazing that Iran is supplying Russia with arms. Who would have ever thought such a thing could happen? Um, and, and you've got this whole thing. This is this is something we can talk about another time, but this is just where the world is. And we have to understand that that's what's going on. So I'm done with that part of the presentation. Um, I think if there's any, I think it's time for questions, Carl. So, yeah, so I, I have a number of questions that people have submitted in advance. And I thank sure. you for all those. We won't necessarily be able to cover all those, but I assure you they will be answered. But I do want to encourage everybody who's still watching right now, if you have any questions or observations that you'd like to share, put them in a chat right now. We'll be referring to those, you know, in the next few minutes or so. Stan, I do have one question. It's a more personal question. Uh, so uh, obviously you've shown us the, the horrors of, of what had happened. And you also showed us some of the beauties, uh, some of the scenes uh underground with the Israeli hospitals and all the good that that's still within Israel and within Israelis. My, my question to you is, seeing this, and you're probably still processing, I know I would be, how do you, how did you decompress when you got home after this? What, wh where were you? And, and just kind of share that with us, if you would. It was, it, 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 it was something, um, 
it took a long it took a it took a long time to to get to the point where you know you can talk about these things without breaking down um i did a presentation about a month after and i was okay with it i did a presentation two weeks after and it was hard um i i'm i'm it, it's difficult it's not something i'm used to i never served in the army or participate in any thing like that so to be put in that position it was you know just like like that um that was something that that we're not used to um and it was something that was that was unique because of where we were and and there was a lot of you know israel has always been a place where there's you know just massive contrasts um and and the massive contrasts were there we were in tel aviv during the during the time we were there, we didn't get a single red alert. So we didn't have a single missile launch while we were there. We didn't see any. While we were in while we were in Nativot, I looked up in the sky, I saw one puff of smoke, which was probably an iron dome, which was uh fired off. I didn't hear it, but we saw I saw it up in the sky. As we we're coming back from uh the south, um Rabbi uh Shira Konigsberg, who's a, an old friend, she's the um COO of the Rabbinic Assembly she said she was sitting on the front of the bus and she saw missiles launched towards the north towards israel so we were going through all these things and yet when we were in tel aviv and we were in jerusalem everything was calm ashira and i went for a walk uh for like a three mile walk in jerusalem at 10 o'clock at night because we just had the energy like after that day just to talk and to get it and we were just like it was Jerusalem was normal. It was it was it wasn't normal. It was closed up a lot. There weren't as many. Uh, so the, none of the restaurants were open because everybody was out fighting. There were they 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 took three hundred thousand um, uh, people in their reserves. And and the amazing thing about it was that you know somebody said to us, "How many people do you think reported? Like was it you know a hundred percent?" And the answer is no. It wasn't hundred percent. It was one hundred and thirty five percent. You know there were more people showing up that than could be. And I've heard of people who who missed the call because they were ill and tried to get into their unit and were told, no, you can't come today. Come another time. And they're just, that's what's going on. Yitzar himself, his wife is a major, his two daughters are lieutenants. He was the only one home. His family was away. Gotti was work. Gotti was doing six days a week at the, at the place. Everybody was, was, was working very hard. And yet there was a good thing. The highway between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem was empty. It didn't take us any time at all to drive it. I mean, <clears throat> silly things like that. My daughter has lived in Israel for uh, 22 years now. And, and she used to make jokes about um, uh, going on the buses. And she would say, you know, well, I, I get on the bus because we're in the poor part of town and we're not we're not worth the price of the bombs. You know, and, and they make jokes like that. We would think they're horrendous, but they do that. Um, they're used to living in that environment. It took us a while to get used to it, and it's taken a while to get out of it. I don't think I'll ever be back. You know, uh, it's not going to leave. Not that I'm, not that I'm, I've been, a, you know, hasn't made massive changes. And I don't have to go to Gary for a weekly session. Um, but on the other hand, it, it's not something that I'm going to forget. Sure. Thank you. So let's get to some of the questions now. Number one, do most Israelis support the heavy bombing of Gaza as necessary? Yes. Yes, they understand, and, and everybody understands that for too long, um, it was ignored, and you cannot let someone fire a thousand missiles at you and fire, you know, some missiles back or, or just bomb uh, empty fields to to pretend to be even when these people are are firing them. And the the I'll let you in on a big secret here: um, Israel gets hit with the missiles. Yes, the Iron Dome works, and yes, it works most of the time. But there are still buildings that are hit. There are still people who are hurt. There are still there's still destruction when they fire off um, the missiles. They're unguided. They don't know where they're going. They just kind of aim them. Um, now apparently there are, there are better missiles, better um, that have GPS, etc. And Israel has messed with the GPS. My daughter was telling me she had to go from one building to another that she hadn't been to and she had to walk in a particular way. So she's using her phone to find it and she's going around in circles because they messed up the GPS on them. So the GPS is messed up. So people can't find that the people who want to send packages can't send them in the right way. Right. Right. 
Uh, another question that came in from Tom Sudow. Prior to October 7th, 2023, Israel is a divided society with hundreds of thousands protesting weekly. When you were in Israel in May, you saw the division. What did you find in November as far as unity in Israel? The protests stopped on October 7th in the morning. There was no sign of it. Everybody um, turned around and said, okay, fine, what can we do? How can we help? How can we fix things? And most of the people um, who were involved in that group was it was a group called Brothers and Sisters in Arms. They were the ones who were running the protests. And uh, Tom and Alan um, and I and a few other people went down to the one that was held on Yom Mood. And if you've been to Israel, you know Yom Mood is a party time. And Tel Aviv, in particular, canceled all of the street parties and all the, the fairs and things that they do and just held the protest on Kaplan Street. And there was, I don't know, 200,000, 300,000 people. There was It was an amazing crowd. And um, it was very orderly. It was very, it was, it was, you know, everybody was was united that this was, you know, there was a protest against what the government, what the prime minister was trying to do to escape being thrown in jail. Um October 7th happened that everybody said no that group of brothers and sisters in arms immediately turned and became brothers and sisters to help and they were the ones who set up the relief efforts of the Tel Aviv and other places to collect the goods to collect all the parts I mean people were moved out of their houses and didn't have baby cribs and people donated them and they and they and that and they were the ones who took them and and, and made sure they, they were they were in good condition I mean I met people who were um who were a, a submarine captain um, who was leading part of the group. And there were people, it didn't matter if you were a, a, a captain or, or a corporal, um, people were just working together and doing it, and everybody was there together. This is somewhat of a related question. The question asks, did you see a level of support between Generation Zs, <laughs> meaning younger people, and older people as far as Israelis and their support for the war? Everybody was on board. Um, and, and in fact, um, you know, from what I've heard, much of the Arab population um, was on board. There have been no no significant protests or, or, or developments along that way. And just about everybody understood the, the existential threat. And since Hezbollah decided that they were going to uh, participate too, and that caused that caused problems. Much of the north of Israel is is um, there's a significant Arab and Druze population. The Druzim are always Part of, have always been part of the army, and the Arab uh, population in there has become very much more um, patriotic, and and especially the younger people, and they understand that, uh, especially after seeing what the results were, the, the people who came in and did the destruction didn't care if you were Jewish or Arab or Muslim or Thai or whatever, African, they killed, they didn't care. And they understood that. They understood that because they're Israeli or living in Israel, they were targets and they're not going, they weren't going to let themselves be targets. Another question. And if you can answer this, you get everything that I have. How do you resolve the situation? Um, okay. So if we're talking about Gaza, Hamas has to be re removed completely. Um, they're, they're not there to govern. They're not there to lead their people to, to having, um, better lives. They're there entirely to destroy Israel and to destroy Jews. That's it's in their charter. They talk about it. We don't listen to it. And, and unfortunately our politicians don't listen to it, but that's their point. Their point is to kill Jews and to remove us, remove us from the world, not just Israel. You know, when they talk about the occupied territory, they don't just mean, the area that they refer to as the West Bank. They refer to everything in Israel. Um, the second part of it is that um, we have to convince our our our, um, our politicians that that peace will only come, you know, as Golda Meir said, when the Arabs um, don't want their children to die um, as much as they want to kill ours. You know, when when that comes. When that comes to that that day when people can live in peace, unfortunately, that's not that's not happening. That's not what the situation is. We see that that you know um, in both sides of of, of Palestine, um, the population is 75, 80 percent in favor of what went on. 
Um, and, and that's that can't be that's not a partner for peace. I'm you know sort of just sort of to to argue with one of your presidents about that, but that's just not going to happen. This came in a couple of days ago. Why isn't it mentioned that Israel did not start the war? The public and anti-Semites don't want to remember that even the Israelis weren't prepared for this onslaught. So part of it is part of it is we don't we're not we're not really, really good at what they accuse us of being really, really good at. Um, we're not really good at publicity. We're not really good at telling the story. I had a meeting um, at, a, at the consulate, the Israeli consulate the, on October 10th, and, I, and I'm friendly quite friendly with the with the consul general and i said to her we've got to start playing dirty when it comes to publicity we've got to show them the videos and things and that didn't happen until about two weeks ago when they started showing them the videos to the to the um to the reporters and to others i know our police force has seen it um i re i didn't you know they asked do you want to say and I said, no not necessary I saw the destruction. I don't have to see um, what people, what they did. They documented it. There's no question. When you look at what happened, I mean, even even the, the, the court case at the International Court of Justice in, in, in Belgium, um, or in, I'm sorry, at the Hague, at the Hague um, they talk about the if what Israel has done after October 8th. They don't talk about what happened on October 7th. Right. True. Dan, how, how has this time that you spent in Israel at this period, how has this changed you as a person and as a Jew? I think, it, I think if anything, I've become more visible, which is pretty hard for those who know me. Um, <laughs> but I'm going back. I'm, I've got, an, I've got a, a conference in Jerusalem on the week after next. So I'm leaving on the first for a 10-day trip. Um, so, uh, you know, they, and, and I'm on the, I'm on FaceTime at least a couple times a week, if not more with my daughter who lives in Tel Aviv. Um, and, and, and we, um, it hasn't, I mean, I, I don't think it's affected me terribly. Um, I think it's, you know, one of those things in life you get, you get kicked, you get up, um, you know, maybe I'm unique in that fact, but there's also things that make you feel good. One of them is, and I was told I wasn't supposed to say it, but I'm going to tell you guys about it. You promise you won't tell everybody. Oh, tell everybody. I don't care. Um, my daughter, Nikki, um, who Alan and uh, Alan Cahan and, and uh, Tom met, um, and many of you have met because she was at convention in, in uh, Washington, etc. cetera. Um, she lives in an apartment in Tel Aviv near the beach. And she, um, she went to, um, her apartment has no, uh bomb shelter nor does it does it have a stairway that you can hide in the stairway is an open stairway and she has a friend um she belongs to a uh they call it a running club but it's really more of a party time and they go on on long walks to a bar um and it's 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 an international group she people come from all over and one of the people in her group is a, a German woman who's a diplomat, works for the German embassy in Tel Aviv. And when she heard that Nikki had no um, no uh, uh, bomb shelter, um, she said, you'll come and stay with me. She's a single mother. She's living in, a, in, a, in a, an apartment that, um, that the German embassy pays for her, has four bedrooms and its own private bomb shelter. And she moved in there um, and very happy and and the woman was was very pleased nikki was invited to the german embassy new year's party um and she was the jew at the party and everybody was there and everyone was talking to the military attache the police liaison all these people were talking to her and she said to them and it's very very striking in israel that that um the germans have been the best friends above everyone else in terms of support and in terms of um, help to Israel at this time, um, better than anyone. And she said that to them. And and, and she said the, the military attache and the police um, liaison were almost in tears when they heard that. And I think the lesson from that is that 
you know, our worst enemies, 80, you know, during Second World War are now our best friends. Okay. And if that can happen, there's a chance that that it can happen in the future for everyone. And it's 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 something to take away that's positive, that that there's a chance that we can do this. I mean, we we have a tendency to, you know, this is one of the things I remember from from one of our sessions at an LDI many years ago. And one of the things somebody said was, you know, men try and fix things, right? Well, sometimes people try and fix things that aren't really theirs to fix. And when um, a group of nations get together and decide they're going to solve the problem with Israel and Hamas, where they have no skin in the game, they're not the ones who are being bombarded or, or, or having these issues. It's a difficult position to be in, and it's not something you really want to, um, to be part of. And, and it's hard for people to say stop. And I know that that uh, the Prime Minister Netanyahu is having a hard time um, trying to deal with this. I know that in my country, my Prime Minister um, ha has been extremely um, neutral to the point of being uh, impossible. And, and we've complained. Um, and that's what we have to do. We have to tell them, though, you know, this is a situation we taught. We hear we hear we hear things about what's going on. And you got to remember that that. Israel happens to have the highest number of news agencies and news organizations and reporters anywhere in the world. And it because it's a lovely place to be. I was at a wedding with Ashira Konigsberg and her husband in the Galilee one time. And we're sitting there at, at, uh, at the table. And there's a fellow beside me. He's an Egyptian journalist. And he lives in, Tel Aviv, in Jerusalem with his wife, who happens to be an UNRWA worker. And she was driving down to Gaza every day. It's a 45, 50 minute drive. And they were able to live in, in Jerusalem. In, and he had no idea of what Israeli society was all about. He said to me, I don't understand it here. He said, I take my son out in the park and I speak to him in Arabic and no one says anything. And I looked at him. I said, why would they? Arabic is one of the languages of Israel. No one has any problems with it. He lived there for a number of years. He didn't get it. We have to understand that there's a situation there that that is something that is is going on. They have to deal with it. They can deal with it. And what they need is our support and not blind support. I understand that. But we have to be able to understand that there are times when sitting on this side of the two ponds, um, and not being in the position of having to 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 look for a shelter every two minutes, um, it's a different story. I got to tell you, when I got off the plane at, at JFK, the first thing I did was look to see where the shelters were. Like it just became like I went and I, and I slapped myself for it because you know I've been doing that for a couple of days, and suddenly here I was in back in the United States. And looking for the same things, I didn't understand. That was one of the change. Had to get used to that different level of of of, of understanding and different level of experience. Yeah. So I do share your 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 hope, your deep hope, deep in the soul of your body about someday we can make this work once we get Absolutely. rid of the bad guys. So one or two more questions, uh, Gary sure. Cates. Given the impact of the post 10-7 Israel trip has had on you, Stan, are you aware of any other agencies? that are offering similar witnessing trips, particularly to the impressionable students on college campuses, oh, so important. I don't know that there's anyone doing them for college campuses. I, I'll ask and I'll get back to you guys. I'll find out if that's possible. Um, but I know that there have been, um, United Synagogue and Masorti have been running them on a regular basis. I know that Ramah, um, Ramah has been doing them. Um, Alan Gottesman is leaving at the end of the month for not, uh, no, at the end of next month. He's, he's going shortly. He's got a, he's on one of the Ramad trips. The problem is that, that you, you really don't want to, um, Tom says, uh, young Judea and, and J and, and JNF, they're all, they are doing them. The problem is, and this is one of the things we, we talked about was, does it become disaster tourism, you know, and, and are we going to be keeping these places in this in the, in the condition they are so people can visit them and see the destruction 
And yet, you know, there are people who want to go back to their homes in, in Barrie and, and Kfaraza and Netivot and all the places that, that had, you know, trauma inflicted on them. The last question, and I, this was actually addressed today in the uh, nightly news. Do you think Saudis and Gulf states will play a role in stabilizing the situation? I think they've put out a little bit of a, uh, not an olive branch, but maybe just like a fig out there saying that, uh, so, indeed, if Israel stops bombing and, you know, they can sort of uh, mediate uh, a discussion that, that peace may come at hand. Right, of course, we so, don't know about Hamas, but I want to hear what you have to say. About all right. That. So one of the things I often say is that sometimes people... Um, play checkers okay checkers is easy you jump a guy you're, you're in you, you take him over and you're done it's a very simple game there's not a lot of strategy this is the this is chess on a, on an incredible level um at that meeting we had in at the consulate in in october 10th there was one of the uh, a Likud member of the knesset was there he was supposed to speak to us that's why we had the meeting and i said to i asked him in the group discussion i said so you know how close was the deal with the Saudis, right? It was, everything had been done with that deal. That deal is signed, is not signed because it takes, it's going to take Netanyahu and Herzog and the king and the pr crown prince to sign it, but all the details have been worked out, okay? When we look at the chart that I showed before, who would be hurt by that, by Israel and the Saudis creating peace? The Iranians. Who do the Iranians control? Hamas. They'll tell you six ways from Sunday that they didn't have anything to do with it. You should pardon the expression, but bull cucky. They had everything to do with the timing. This broke up that. The Saudis are, are saving face right now because there's a war going on. They don't want to appear to be publicly um, committing to Israel when, they're, when their Arab brethren are, are, are fighting. But you can be sure that that there's no way that the Saudis are not waiting for this to be over before they're going to sign something immediately. Right. Immediately. Thank you. Well, Stan, I want to thank you personally, as well as on behalf of everybody here tonight and FJMC for being our guest speaker for our first Israel on My Mind webinar. You've provided us with, with clarity, with insight, and even more important, with more emotional connection to, to a country that we love. Um, so thank you so much. And we hope to see you again soon. I Thanks. also personally want to thank uh, Bruce Fagan for his keen technical insight in helping us put together the, uh, the webinar tonight. Uh, but mostly I want to thank every person on this call right now for being a part of our discussion. I appreciate your questions and suggestions and insight. And uh, I hope we get together again soon. Uh, our next webinar is scheduled for the last Monday in February, February 26th, where we will hopefully feature a young rabbi, a little different perspective, uh, who lived in Israel for a while, currently a, a rabbi in the States, and the rabbi has three young children, uh, so it'll be a little different perspective, but I'm hoping that everybody can join us then. Thank you again, and be well. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. And uh, if you get a chance, please, everyone take a, please, please make sure you met, you become members of Merkaz. That's our Zionist organization. And um, it's important that we're all members. Absolutely. Good night, everybody.